to whatever extreme we swing consciously, writes Helen Luke in her iconic book Dark Wood to White Rose, we must come to know the opposite, which is gripping us in the unconscious. And this, in essence, is what the Purgatorio is all about, and most especially upon the seven terraces that lay ahead of our pilgrims now. Each terrace corresponds to one of the seven deadly sins, all of which are perversions of love, of love gone wrong, as we have said. The first three are for the atonement of souls who through pride, envy and wrath have caused others or themselves to suffer. The fourth is for the slothful and the last three for those whose excesses of avarice and prodigality, gluttony and lust have led them far from the path that their lives might otherwise have taken. On the mountain, they have chanced to meditate upon their life choices and, through contemplation of the corresponding virtue, raise their consciousness and move on up the mountain. Now Dante has created a template for each of the terraces ahead, described to us by Virgil as the whip and bridle. Each begins with a depiction of the virtue to be attained, starting with a scene recalled from the life of the Virgin, inspired by the popular Marian litany, Mirror of the Blessed Virgin Mary, familiar to medieval audiences. These reflections function as the whip, if you like, designed to guide the penitent toward the light. The poets then meet the penitents, witness their purgation, and converse with souls who are willing. Next, they are shown examples of the vice, the sin, as it were, that inhibits the attainment of the virtue. These examples function as the bridle. Finally, a prayer or beatitude is intoned, and the angel, most associated with the virtue of the terrace, appears, removes one of the letter P's inscribed on Dante's forehead, and guides the pilgrims to the next level. When the flaws of those whom they meet are corrected, they too are permitted to ascend. There is a kind of contrapasso here too, reminiscent of the inferno. The proud must bow down in humble posture. Those blinded by envy can no longer see. Those whose judgment was clouded by rage are engulfed in black, acrid smoke. The slothful must continually run about in haste. The gluttonous are forever hungry, and the lustful must walk through fire, not to ignite their passion, but to purify their souls. Yet however harsh their purgation may seem, each soul is guaranteed salvation. No one knows how long it will take, but all have hope and willingly enter in. On the first terrace, pride becomes humility. Pride is the gravest, the first and the most sovereign sin, wrote Thomas Aquinas, one of Dante's heroes. It is an excessive desire for one's own excellence which rejects subjection to God. As our poets emerge onto the terrace of the prideful through a tight cleft in the rock, they are greeted by the most extraordinary sight. The mountain ridge is pure white marble, sculpted with the most exquisite friezes so beautifully rendered, Dante tells us, so lifelike, 
that nothing on earth can compare. The first depicts the Annunciation of the Virgin. The second, King David, dancing with wild abandon as he delivers the Ark of the Covenant into the city of Jerusalem. And the third, the Roman Emperor Trajan, who famously delayed a military operation to avenge the murder of a poor widow's son. The penitents here are bent double under the weight of huge boulders that they must carry on their backs whilst chanting a modification of the Pater Noster, the Lord's Prayer, a version that focuses upon humility, the virtue to be achieved. So weighed down are they that they are hardly recognisable as men, save for the panting and weeping and the weary moan of one such poor soul who cries out, Piu non posso, piu non posso, I can no more. The prayer they chant is set out for us in full, the only time in the entire poem that Dante chooses to do this, and this in itself is worthy of note. But also, say some of the commentators, the modifications that Dante makes in one way of looking really do reveal his own pride and conceit. For who would dare to meddle with such a seminal prayer? Dante's poetic prowess is uncontested, of course, and maybe the narrative is served by his bold interventions. But even so, we can only wonder at his intentions here, for surely he must have realised the inferences the reader might draw. Well, the souls trudge on in faith and in hope, praying for themselves and for those left behind. And Dante is deeply touched. Truly, we should help them wash away the stain, he says to Virgil, that they have carried from here, so that light and pure they might issue to the starry spheres. Eager to converse now, he approaches several of the penitents. The first being Umberto Aldobrandeschi, who confesses to Dante that in life, forgetting all souls have a common mother, he arrogantly held everyone in scorn. Now in death, he explains, and until God is satisfied, I must carry this burden since I did not do so among the living. Dante then speaks with Odorisi da Gubbio, a renowned painter of illuminated manuscripts, who once worked for Pope Boniface VIII, and he knew Giotto, the famous painter from Florence, but his work had been eclipsed by several younger, more talented artists, and this had been very hard to bear. Dante and Virgil then move on around the terrace, where they see further carvings hewn into the floor, showing infamously proud figures from both biblical and classical sources, the first of which is Lucifer, the great fallen angel, one so close and beloved of the Creator. Nimrod is depicted here too, with his proud tower, and Ariachne from Greek myth. She who took so much pride in her weaving, she dared to challenge the goddess Minerva to a contest. The goddess then promptly responded by transforming her into a spider condemned to spin her intricate webs without praise for evermore. The final scene, Dante tells us, is that of proud Ilium, the entire fallen city of Troy. 
the angel of humility then appears and ushers the poets on to the terrace above. He brushes Dante's forehead and he suddenly feels lighter and quickly realises that one of the letter P's inscribed upon his brow by the gatekeeper has been removed. And as they move on up the mountain, they hear the first beatitude. Beati pauperus spiritu. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the voices sang so sweetly, no speech could describe it, Dante tells us. Ah, how different these openings are from hell's. Here we enter with songs, and down there with savage groaning. Well, the poets soon emerge onto the second terrace, where they are greeted by a sight that brings Dante to tears. Here, the sin of envy, second of the deadly sins, is being purged, and the souls sit huddled together, clothed in coarse sackcloth, like ragged beggars on the narrow mountain ledge. Unseen voices, spirits on the wing, Dante tells us, swirl around them, crying out examples of generosity and mercy the virtue to be attained here. And all souls have their eyes sewn shut with iron wire because, Helen Luke explains, they were unable to rejoice at the sight of beauty or goodness in others. The Virgin's words of generosity spoken to her son at the wedding in Cana echo around the terrace. They have no wine, the voices call. They have no wine. Then there is the voice of Orestes and his friend Pallades from Greek myth, who famously tried to save each other's life by selflessly offering up themselves in the other's place. I am Orestes, the voices cry. I am Orestes. Then the words of Jesus are spoken from the Sermon on the Mount. Love your enemies and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Dante then speaks to one of the souls who turns with interest toward him. A sapia I was named, she tells him, though sapient, wise I was not. And I was far happier in others' harm than in my own good fortune. And she then confesses how she had secretly taken pleasure in the defeat of her fellow Ghibellines and in the death of her young nephew who fought with them. Now she must atone, she tells Dante, and she asks him to pray for her. And if ever he returns to Tuscany, to seek out her family and tell them she is well. Now the fact that Dante still lives draws attention of several other penitents on the ledge, including Guido del Duca and Rinieri da Calboli, both of whom now speak. Who is this? said the first that circles round the mount before death has allowed him flight and who opens and closes his eyes at will. You who are nearest question him and greet him gently so that he might speak. O oh soul, said the other, bring us consolation and tell us where you are from and who you are since you make us wonder greatly at your state of grace, as a thing does that was never known before. Dante then explains, he is from Tuscany, where the river Arno flows, but that they would not know him, for he is little known as yet. The two men then bemoan the situation in Italy, and most especially 
along the banks of the Arno, where men have become like beasts, they say, in their dealings with one another. The poets listen until the souls exhaust themselves and turn to weeping. And journeying on then, alone, a voice struck us, Dante explains, like lightning when it splits the air, saying, Everyone who findeth me shall slay me. It is the voice of Cain, who cried out in the wilderness after God cast him out for murdering his brother Abel out of envy. The voice of a glorious is heard too, floating through the air. She, who in Greek mythology tried to prevent the god Mercury from visiting her beautiful sister Hersey, and was promptly turned to stone. Our poets hasten on, and the angel of mercy approaches. It was Vespers, evening there in purgatory, and the sun's rays were striking us mid-face, Dante tells us, when I felt my forehead far more burdened by the splendour than before, and the unknown nature of it stunned me, so that I lifted my hands above my eyes and made that shade which dims the excess light. Sweet father, what is that from which I cannot shade my sight? He answered, it is a messenger that comes to invite us to climb. Soon, seeing these things will not be painful to you, but a joy as great as nature has equipped you to feel. And as they left, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy, was sung, and rejoice, you who conquer.